Good morning. Thank you for being here today. My name is Lisa Reinsberg. I'm the executive director of the International Justice Resource Center, which is an organization uh, pretty new to the Bay Area. And um, it's been great since we've moved here to see the level of interest in learning about the international human rights framework from so many different kinds of attorneys and advocates. So I am thrilled that you're here today. Um, as you know, we have a, a full day and a half long agenda of different panels, um, so I hope you'll stick around for all of those. Um, what I'd like to do is first thank the people who have made today and tomorrow's sessions possible, and then give a brief overview of the International Human Rights Framework to sort of uh, give you some background for the speakers to come. So first I have to thank the Center for, Center for Gender and Refugee Studies here at UC Hastings. Um, thanks to Karen Masala, we have this beautiful space to use today, and her team has been amazing in getting everything set up. Um, I'd also like to thank our other sponsors, the US Human Rights Network and the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, whose support is due to Jamil Dakwar here in the front, who in addition to being a wonderful IGRC board member, <laughs> is uh, really actively involved in um, the US human rights movement, including through the US Human Rights Network and his work at the ACLU. Um, I hope you also get a chance to meet Tina and Zakir here from the Asian Law Caucus, another one of our co-sponsors. Um, they've been an amazing help. And for the IJRC team, you've probably already met Diane <laughs> and Jenny, who is out at the front, and Milo, um, all of whom are helping out. And if you have any questions, you can uh, ask them or ask me at any point today. Um, finally, I wanted to thank our last co-sponsor, the Center for Justice and Accountability, represented here by Pamela Merchant here at the back. <laughs> um, since we've been in the Bay Area a year now, Pamela has been the most welcoming and kindest uh, supporter I could ask for, and um, I think she sort of, and her team at CJA, represent this spirit of um, no interest I and welcome <laughs> that is uh, representative of the Bay Area. And uh, I don't know a more generous person, so thank you, Pamela. Um, so today's agenda, we're gonna be hearing from some of the most experienced people in the international human rights field here in the United States, and we are very, very lucky to have them. Um, in your folder of materials, we've tried to kind of help you out for those of you whom um, this is a new area of law. In the left-hand side, you're going to see in addition to the agenda and your speaker's bios. There are two handouts kind of explaining the international human rights framework from the US perspective. So one of those is a really <laughs> very summary version of um, what, what international human rights mechanisms the United States participates in. And the other is a list of terms and acronyms so that when you hear people starting to talk about the CAT and the CERD and the ICCPR and the IACHR, you know what the heck is going on, hopefully. <laughs> I hope that helps. Um, then on the right hand, oh, actually in that left hand side still, at the back is a survey, which I would really, really uh, ask you pretty please to fill out before you go. Um, part of it you can fill out along the way. You can rank um, or rate our speakers um, and kind of give us your feedback on the different sessions, which will be really helpful for us in understanding your interests and in developing future trainings. Um, then on the right-hand side, you are going to see some handouts relevant to a few of the different sessions, um, mostly on the ICCPR, but also on the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. And in front of those, you'll see two CDs. One is um, a video that uh, IGRC developed last year along with a manual on the Inter-American Human Rights System, which is one of the mechanisms you'll hear about today. And the other is a video, or, sorry, a CD of materials for this training. Um, it's all of the treaties, all of the decisions, um, pretty much, hopefully, everything that you'll be hearing about today, as well as a manual that we've developed for this training, uh, kind of fleshing out the summary of where the United States stands uh, in the International Human Rights Framework. So, turning to um, the agenda itself, um, I'd like to just kind of give you a little bit of background on the International Human Rights Framework. So our goal today is that you will, regardless of your familiarity to this point with uh, the human rights system, that you'll come away with an understanding of the advocacy channels that are available to you 
as an advocate working on public interest issues here in the United States. Um, we're accustomed to thinking of the US Constitution as sort of our, our strongest tool, the most fundamental protection, but uh, in reality, the international human rights system, both the treaties and the bodies that enforce them can be really powerful tools for raising awareness, for kind of changing the policy debate, and for also giving victims a chance to make their stories heard. Um, so I hope that you'll see some concrete examples of that as we go through the next day and a half. Um, so what is the international human rights framework? It's um, a term that I've already used probably 20 times in the last <laughs> two minutes without explaining it. Um, but what that is essentially is several different systems um, that are partly independent from um, one another. There are, are different regional systems that operate independently and then there's what's called the universal system, which is those bodies created by the United Nations and can therefore potentially have a universal scope. So for our purposes, the regional system that's relevant to the United States is the inter-American system. Um, that, like the United Nations mechanisms, was created by an intergovernmental body, the Organization of American States. Um, and through that body, beginning in 1948, with the adoption of the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, we started to see uh, in the mid last century this sort of um, formalization of human rights mechanisms used to hold states accountable to promises that they made both to their fellow states, countries, and to their citizens to respect certain fundamental rights. And our understanding of those rights has grown, it has increased over time with the adoption of new treaties, with um, case law interpreting what those treaties mean. And so today it's a rather robust system with many different components, which you'll learn about today. Um, I think that that is all that I'll say. Um, our first panel will go into a bit of depth on the United Nations mechanisms, so I don't want to um, have too much overlap with them. Uh, and our second panel actually will also focus quite in depth on one of those. <laughs> They're excited too about human rights. Um, <laughs> The second panel will um, go into depth on the ICCPR and the Human Rights Committee. Um, and then later this afternoon, we'll, we'll really look at the um, inter-American system. So without further ado, uh, we'll get started with our first panel on the United Nations Human Rights Mechanisms. Um, Risa Kaufman is going to join Colin Bailey and Alberto Saldamondo here on our panel um, to discuss several of the different Uni United Nations human rights mechanisms. Risa Kaufman is uh, the executive director of the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School, uh, where she does a very many, <laughs> very many things, um, including putting on really fantastic CLE programs um, every year, which if you're able to make it to New York in the spring are fabulous. Um, she also heads the Bringing Human Rights Home Lawyers Network, which is, if you aren't already familiar with it, um, a fabulous tool for staying engaged with what other advocates in the United States are working on um, from a human rights perspective. So I'll let Risa introduce our other panelists and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Risa Kaufman with the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School. So first, thanks so much to Lisa um, and the International Justice Resource Center and all of its wonderful co-sponsors for organizing this fantastic event and for inviting me here today. I'm really thrilled to speak with you um, about ways in which US advocates can engage with the international human rights system, and in particular, the UN human rights system. So I came to this, as many of you are coming to this, as a domestic social justice lawyer. Um, I was doing civil rights work and anti-poverty work um, for many years and became very frustrated with the tools that were available um, to do this work and became increasingly interested in working uh, through the human rights system and engaging a human rights framework to advance my advocacy goals. Um, and I'm very lucky to have a job where that's what I do. The, um, I direct the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School and the focus of my work and a large project at the Human Rights Institute is focusing on human rights in the United States. Uh, part of what I do, as Lisa mentioned, is I direct the Bringing Human Rights Home Lawyers Network, which has grown to over 500 lawyers and legal advocates around the country who are um, interested and committed to engaging 
of human rights framework and their domestic social justice work. So I'm curious if any of you are members of the network. Great, okay, excellent. So my goal by the end of uh, this morning and perhaps um, if I can um, <laughs> co-opt the goals of this CLE is uh, by the end of the next few days, you all will be so enamored and excited by the idea um, and the prospects, the opportunities of using a human rights framework that you will all will join the Bring Human Rights Home Lawyers Network. And you can do that very easily by um, emailing me and we can sign you up. We have a listserv, we have in-person meetings and you can also participate telephonically. We always start afternoon so that we can get our West Coast uh, members on board and we have CLEs and other trainings. Um, so as you heard from Lisa, a human rights framework incorporates both a set of standards and a set of strategies for advocacy. Engaging the UN system unlocks both the standards and the strategies, or at least an important subset of them. So in this session, we're going to explore how advocates can engage in human rights advocacy with the international mechanism and translate um, successes and results into advocacy with domestic policymakers, um, with uh, grassroots mobilization efforts and potentially litigation in U.S. courts, although you'll hear more about litigation tomorrow. I'm really quite thrilled to be joined on this panel um, by Alberto Saldamando. Um, Alberto is an attorney with an international indigenous human rights advocate with decades of experience working at the local and international level to advance the rights of indigenous communities, immigrants, and farm workers. He was for many years the general counsel of uh, the International Indian Treaty Council. Um, and Colin Daly, who um, is the executive director at the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water, which is an organization working to secure access to affordable, safe, and clean water for folks in California, um, including through their successful Human Right to Water campaign, which I'm hoping we'll hear more about. Uh, he was previously a staff attorney with the Legal Services of Northern California. So Chris, can you guys hear me in the back? It's like a really big microphone. <laughs> it just seems like, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna set the stage for this discussion by providing a brief, brief overview of the international mechanisms um, that we're gonna be discussing, just so that we're all on the same page. So I imagine some of you have had some experience working with the international system. We're also really thrilled that there are folks here who are new to engaging international mechanisms, so we wanna make sure everybody is on the same page. And your materials that Lisa put together are fantastic. Um, I hope you'll refer back to them frequently. Um, just a note by uh, talking about the international system, I'm going to be talking and we're going to be talking about the UN human rights system. Um, the next panel, I believe, will be talking about the regional human rights system um, that the U.S. participates in, the inter-American system. So after I give an overview, Alberto will uh, discuss engagement with the third body um, and Colin will discuss methods of engagement with UN special procedures. Uh, so before I start uh, running through this alphabet soup, I just want to solicit your ideas, your thoughts, um, why U.S. advocates might engage with the U.N. system. What do you think might be some benefits of using the U.N. for U.S. advocates to engage with the U.N.? Don't be shy. An international audience, absolutely. You get to engage with the international community. I saw somebody in the back. Raising awareness. Raising awareness. Where? Absolutely, it's a platform, right, to, um, to engage in conversations both in uh, the domestic realm and uh, with local communities. Other thoughts about why U.S. advocates might go to the U.N.? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. As I said, this unlocks both the standards and the strategies. The standards are very robust and in many cases more robust than uh, at least at the federal level. Other ideas? It's an opportunity to what we call shame and blame, right? Or blame and shame, uh, depending on the order. Um, other thoughts? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. A way to engage and to build solidarity, create alliances, right? To break down silos both geographically and in terms of substantive areas through uh, across communities. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It helps us to, to contribute to building an international standard and creating an international standard, making it a more robust system for everyone around the world. 
So any uh, challenges that you, oh, so there was another benefit, yeah. Absolutely, it's there for us to use, right? There's no, no reason for it to be there unless advocates are going to use it. So do you see any challenges with engaging with the UN system? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is a giant bureaucracy with um, many, many parts. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. So particularly for the United States, um, enforcement um, is difficult, although I'm going to challenge us to think creatively about what it means to enforce standards and to think more about accountability and different ways of holding our government accountable. Um, but yes, I think um, particularly as lawyers, we like to think that there's enforcement and there's remedy, um, but it's particularly challenging with the UN system. But that, I think, is an opportunity for us to think creatively. Other challenges? Yes. So we, yes, so we have actually signed quite a number of the treaties. We haven't ratified a number of them, absolutely. Um, so that is absolutely a challenge. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, signing versus ratification. Um, when we have signed, we still have some obligations and we can still use yeah. the standards. But engaging with the mechanisms in particular is challenging when we haven't ratified the treaties. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Yeah, so there, it, there's a broad swath of issues, many communities and organizations working on these, um, although some would see that as an as a, as a advantage too, right, because human rights standards are so interrelated and do cover all of the social justice issues we're working on, um, but it can be a challenge to get your voice heard. That's where creating alliances and solidarity can come in. Other challenges? Yeah, in the back. Absolutely. So there's a lot of resistance um, in the United States in particular to um, international engagement, right? Um, and so there are, we can talk about strategies for overcoming that resistance. Um, I think in particular in a panel later today, we're going to talk about local implementation of human rights and some would see that as a way to perhaps overcome some of that resistance. But there's absolutely a lot of political resistance to engaging internationally and folks see international standards as being something imposed on the United States and there's resistance to that. Um, so one other barrier, very practical barrier, if you want to engage in the UN in Geneva, it's really far and it's a really expensive city, <laughs> more expensive than San Francisco. Um, so getting there can be really hard. It's very hard for organizations to, um, to participate um, in person, so it's definitely a challenge, although there's also the UN in New York as well, um, although many of the treaty bodies that we participate with are housed in Geneva. So uh, this is not the, you know, the magic bullet for everything. I think it's important for us all to keep in our heads both the advantages, the benefits of engaging with the UN system and what the challenges are so that we can think about ways to overcome some of those challenges also. Okay, so let's actually get to what I was asked to speak about, the nuts and bolts of the UN system. So let's sort through some of this alphabet. Oh, it does work. Great. Okay, so the UN system includes um, human rights treaty bodies um, and um, UN charter-based bodies through the UN Human Rights Council. And the two that I'm going to talk about are the Universal Periodic Review, or the UPR, and Special Procedures. This will all um, make a lot of sense very soon. Okay, so we're going to start with treaties. <coughs> As you know, or... Um, hopefully, uh, you will know, the U.S. has ratified three core human rights treaties, the Race Convention, or CERD, the Civil and Political Rights Treaty, or the ICCPR, and the Torture Convention, or the CAT. We've also ratified two of the optional protocols 
to uh, the Children's Rights Convention, the optional protocol on the sale of children, child prostitution, and child pornography, and the optional protocol on children in armed conflict. So as a side note, um, as I alluded to before, it's good to keep in mind that the US has signed, but not ratified, a number of other human rights treaties. The Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Treaty, the Women's Treaty, or CEDAW, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, or the CRC, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or the CRPD. Um, and because the US hasn't ratified these treaties, um, advocates are limited in their ability to engage with them um, in UN-based advocacy, but you certainly can and you should draw on the standards um, that are included in these treaties in other human rights-based advocacy, which you'll be discussing throughout this training. But back to the ratified treaties. So when the US ratifies human rights treaty, it accepts the obligation to periodically report on its compliance to a committee of independent experts, otherwise known as the treaty body. Um, so there are four treaty bodies that have jurisdiction, I use that term very loosely, um, over the United States because we've ratified the treaties associated with those treaty bodies. And so you'll hear those referred to throughout the day. Those are the Human Rights Committee, which oversees compliance with the ICCPR, the Committee on the Elimination of Race Discrimination, which oversees compliance with the CERD, the Committee Against Torture, which oversees compliance with the CAT, and the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which oversees compliance both with the CRC and the optional protocols to the CRC, which the US has ratified. Now the treaty review process is a really important moment for US advocates to engage uh, with the UN human rights system. The process itself begins when the country up for review submits its official report on compliance to the treaty monitoring body. Um, and it's supposed to happen on a periodic basis. Of course, countries are always late in filing their report, but there is in fact actually a schedule by which the countries are supposed to submit their reports. Each treaty body has its own procedures, um, but once it receives the official report, the treaty body typically prepares a list of uh, issues and questions for the country under review to answer prior to the review um, as a supplement and clarification of its report. And then the review itself takes place at the UN, um, usually in Geneva, as a public session. It's supposed to be an interactive, productive dialogue between the government under review and the body, the treaty body, the body of experts to identify the human rights concerns um, and the potential solutions. And at the end of the, the review itself, the committee of experts issues a set of concluding observations or recommendations that advocates can then bring back and draw on in their domestic advocacy. So the, the review itself offers many opportunities for advocates um, to engage with both their own government and with the international community. Um, and you'll hear specific examples of these, but I just want to suggest some of them. Um, so we can raise awareness, as somebody mentioned, about the, the treaty and the government and our government's obligations under the treaty. We can engage with government officials directly, um, particularly through civil society consultations that are conducted in conjunction with the review. We can try to influence the expert committee's list of issues uh, through short submissions to the treaty body and through lobbying efforts with the expert committee. It's a very, very strange system. There's, um, there's no bar against ex parte communication. You can approach the experts directly and talk with them about concerns that you have in your community um, to try to influence them. We can document human rights concerns through shadow reports, um, which are submitted to the treaty body as a supplement to the government's official report. We can attend the review um, and hold side events um, in conjunction with the, the review. The side, side events are held close to the review. It's an opportunity for civil society to engage, um, to present reports, host panel discussions, and otherwise engage government and non-governmental actors. Once the committee issues its recommendations, we can incorporate those recommendations into our advocacy. Um, we can, for example, by submitting them um, as persuasive support in litigation and in administrative efforts, um, engaging in media and other outreach, and just raising public awareness about the issues that are addressed during the course of the review. And finally, we can reach out to our state and local governments um, to raise their awareness about the treaties, ask them to engage in reporting um, and to consider the recommendations um, that come out of the review and consider local policies in light of those recommendations. So these are just a few of the ways that um, I would suggest to you that advocates can engage in the treaty review. 
So as you'll hear um, quite a bit from Jamil um, later today, the U.S. is up for review by the Human Rights Committee this year. We're really right in the middle of this review cycle um, for its compliance with, uh, with the ICCPR. The in-person review will, will take place in October of this year. Um, and we expect the U.S. to be reviewed by the third committee and by the CAT in 2014 or 15. And I say we expect because, of course, it all depends on when the U.S. files its report to trigger this review. Um, I understand that the committees have the opportunity, the option to um, conduct a review in the absence of a country submitting its review. I think they would be very hesitant to do that for the United States, and I don't think that they ever have. Um, I doubt that they would. So the review itself, yikes, um, requires the U.S. to submit its report. So I need to hurry up. So in addition to con conducting the periodic review, um, treaty bodies have the authority to hear individual complaints. It's not an option in the U.S. Um, because the U.S. hasn't recognized individual complaints functions of the treaties. Um, the exception is the CERD Committee's relatively recent uh, function of the Early Warning and Urgent Action Procedure, which you will hear more about from Alberto. Okay, so the U.N. Charter Bodies. Um, the special thing about UN charter bodies um, is that um, they um, are particularly useful for U.S. advocates because they monitor a country's compliance with the full range of the rights in the UN charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it's particularly a way that U.S. advocates can um, raise concerns about economic, social, and cultural rights um, with, with the charter bodies. And the two that I'm going to talk about are the Universal Periodic Review and the Special Procedures. So the Universal Periodic Review, or the UPR, it's a relatively new procedure, um, and it requires the human rights record of each of the 192 countries belonging to the UN to be reviewed once every four years. Um, unlike the treaty body reviews, which are uh, conducted by a committee of experts, uh, the UPR is intended to be a peer review, where theoretically every member country of the UN can ask questions and make recommendations of the country that's under review. As I said, it's based on the UN Charter, UDHR, the human rights treaties the country has ratified, and any other voluntarily very voluntary pledges and commitments made by the country. Um, because it's a peer review uh, rather than an expert review, some think it's more political. Political doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's just another way of exerting pressure on a country. Like um, the process, like the treaty review process, it has many, uh, it provides many opportunities for civil society um, to engage. The country under review first submits its report, like with the treaty bodies, um, which is an assessment of its own record. The UPR requires that countries engage in consultation um, with all of the relevant stakeholders. Um, so it provides a lot of opportunities for advocates to participate in consultations with their government. Um, like with the treaty review, civil society can submit uh, um, their own reports. They're called stakeholder reports with the UPR. Um, ultimately, after a lot of inner workings, there's an in-person three-hour interactive dialogue in Geneva, um, during which, at least theoretically, all of the UN countries can ask questions of the country under review. And at a later session, the country under review either accepts or rejects the recommendations, and a report of the review is uh, formally adopted. The U.S.'s first UPR took place in November of 2010 um, with remarkable civil society engagement. Um, that was coordinated by the U.S. Human Rights Network. In advance of the review and its report, the U.S. State Department held nine consultations um, throughout the country, or 11 consultations, depending on how you count. They're very proud of this. They thought this was really a gold standard they were going to set for the rest of the world. And they, it was, frankly, it was quite a remarkable effort for the State Department to make. Advocates um, were disappointed because a lot of the issues that they raised in the consultations were not reflected in the government's report. Um, so folks thought in some ways it was a bit of a token, um, but, it, but it was a step forward that it took place. Advocates filed 103 stakeholder reports. Um, a lot of advocates engaged in advocacy before the review, lobbying um, representatives and delegates um, in Geneva and Washington and in New York to get their concerns heard, um, and then those questions were actually raised in the review. About 70 advocates and organizations went to Geneva for the review. Lots of them advocated um, and uh, participated in side events at the UN. At the review itself, more than 50 countries asked the U.S. Um, questions, engaged them on issues ranging from U.S. detention policy to the death penalty to the U.S.'s failure to ratify key human rights treaties um, and to establish an independent human rights monitoring system. 
the U.S. innovated a town hall session after the review, so they invited uh, the civil society participants who went to Geneva, and then they had a, a feed to Washington, D.C., um, and that was actually a bit more of a frank conversation um, with the 33 um, U.S. delegates, uh, government representatives that were there. Um, the U.S. is up for review again in 2015. I should say that the review itself resulted in 228 recommendations for ways in which the U.S. can improve human rights in the United States. That was, at least at the time, a record for the number of recommendations for any country that had been reviewed. Um, and, and the U.S. was fairly late in the cycle, so it was quite remarkable. Did they? Well, congratulations to Cuba. Um, <laughs> I would imagine the U.S. may Cuba? set another record again in 2015. <laughs> so the U.S. <laughs> So the U.S. is up for review in 2015. Planning is already underway with civil society and with the government, so it's a way for you all to plug in, for everyone to plug in. Okay, finally, special procedures. Um, this, this is the other of the U.N. charter-based mechanisms that I'm going to discuss. Um, special procedures are intended to serve as the eyes and ears um, in evaluating human rights concerns in a specific country or relating to a particular thematic issue. Special procedures are either an individual, um, usually called a special rapporteur, or an independent expert, or a working group with deep subject matter expertise. There are currently 36 thematic um, experts and 13 country-specific special procedures. The thematic mandates cover a broad range of issues, including adequate housing, education, poverty, health, arbitrary detention, uh, migrants, torture, business and human rights, so it's a, a very broad swath of issues. There is no country-specific special procedure for the United States. Nevertheless, thematic experts can conduct country visits, and they do uh, conduct country visits, and they also um, uh, accept direct communications or complaints. Um, and they base, like um, uh, the UPR, they base their evaluations and recommendations on standards drawn from the UDHR and other human rights norms. So again, not dependent on whether a country has ratified a specific treaty, so it unlocks um, the, whole, uh, the whole range of, of human rights standards for a country. Um, like the treaty bodies and unlike the UPR, these are experts, so important to keep that in mind. In recent years, uh, special procedures with thematic uh, mandates have visited the United States, and these include the special rapporteurs on the right to education, the right of migrants, the right to water and sanitation, the right to adequate housing, and a number of others. In the course of these visits, U.S. advocates um, actively engage with the experts and use the visit to, um, to catalyze social mobilization within their communities. We'll hear um, in just a moment from Colin about uh, the visit by the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Water and Sanitation. At the end of their visits, the um, special procedures issue a press statement, and then later they'll issue a report detailing achievements and also challenges um, related to human rights in the United States. And advocates have been very creative about leveraging these um, back into their advocacy. Um, in addition to country visits, um, uh, thematic experts also submit thematic reports that aren't tied to a situation in a particular country. It's also a way to incorporate that into your advocacy. Um, and then they also accept communications, confidential communications or complaints. Um, so that's another way in which advocates can engage with the special procedures. So that's a background. I was not quite as brief as I'd promised to be, um, but hopefully now we can all be on the same page as I turn it over to um, who would like to go first. Um, so Alberto will um, talk with us about the surge Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I've been doing this kind of work uh, for about a little over 20 years, and it's uh, on behalf of indigenous peoples, and it's been very rewarding for us. I think uh, one of the major reasons that we go internationally is because there are no, there is no rec recourse nationally. Uh, colonialism is is being practiced uh, with impunity from the day Columbus landed until now. Uh, the states are uh, taking, continue to take the resources and lands of indigenous peoples with, uh, with uh, relative impunity. So, and there's no place to go but the United Nations. The indigenous peoples have been going to the United Nations since 1977. Uh, 1979, well anyway, this, I, I'm talking about the CERD, not the indigenous peoples, but 
but it's been good for us. And I think the CERD has been uh, particularly good for us. The CERD is, is called the ICERD International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or in the committee, uh, the treaty monitoring body is called the CERD, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The United States ratified in 1994 uh, with regard to, uh, even though international conventions require that the state uh, uh, adopt legislation uh, in order to effectuate the purposes of the convention, the United States t takes the position that uh, the uh, international conventions are not self-executing and they need special legislation in order to become available for the citizens of the state. So in, in essence, we have a a convention on racial discrimination, but if you're discriminated against, you can't complain at least uh, to the CERD or to the Human Rights Committee or to the Committee on Torture uh, uh, with regard to the international uh, complaints procedures. Uh, domestically, you cannot use them uh, technically as, um, as, uh, as standards uh, because they are not self-executing and you need special legislation, but I think hopefully tomorrow we'll find out how we can do it anyway. Uh, the reservations the United States has adopted for the CERD reservations are, uh, are uh, statements that the, that the uh, state makes at the time of the adoption or ratification or accession, where they say, well, we, these are the kinds of standards by which we will uh, uh, effectuate the purposes of the convention. And the United States is a very critical uh, reservation with regard to the CERD in that it uh, will not... Uh, and not impose a CERD where it's incompatible with, uh, with the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and that uh, means that uh, the speech trumps uh, the, the convention, as does uh, private uh, conduct. Con private conduct is also immune from, uh, from the standards of the convention. Also, uh, since the uh, Supreme Court of the United States has uh, adopted uh, a rule um, against affirmative action, which is a very important part of the CERD, mentioned twice in the convention, uh, it is not applicable in the United States. The United States has actually adopted some very interesting arguments with regard to, uh, to affirmative action. One is that uh, affirmative action is no longer required. I've heard them mention that a couple of times, that there is no more uh, need for affirmative action because there is no racial discrimination any longer in the United States, which is a, a, this under, the, under the convention, uh, that's, a, that's an appropriate standard, and uh, who's to argue, you know, except us. Uh, the treaty monitoring body, as you heard, is uh, composed of 18 members nominated by region and elected by the state parties. Hopefully everybody understands that when we talk about states, we're talking about governments, not uh, the state of Alabama or Sonora. Six-year terms, two term limits. They meet twice a year in New York or Geneva. Uh, the, the real meat of the, of the convention is Article I, the definition. Any distinction based on race or ethnic origin which has the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing the enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms is racial discrimination. So you have the distinction based on race or ethnic origin or nationality which has the purpose or effect of nullifying any human right really so that the purposes of the of the statute are very broad, the, I'm sorry, the, the convention are very broad uh, with regard to what, what it constitutes discrimination. Uh, any distinction that impairs the enjoyment of a right, any distinction that impairs any right is racial discrimination. And I, I think that that's been very useful for us in many respects. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get into a couple of examples later, but it's really important to understand that uh, it's a very broad, it's a very broad convention and it's been very useful and can be very useful to a, a great many groups. Uh, actually, and that's another thing about the convention that it talks about group rights uh, and uh, the rights of an individual within the group because it, it does take a group to be discriminated against. Most other, uh, the convention on, I mean the, the Universal Declaration, uh, the, the, uh, the two covenants really talk about individual rights uh, for the most part. Uh, it's been very, that's another difficulty that indigenous peoples have had in, internationally that we've managed to overcome. But essentially they are individual rights. This convention talks about groups, talks about the rights of groups to, 
to the enjoyment of all human rights and the individuals within them, of course. Uh, the substantive articles, uh, part one, you're supposed to adopt special measures, which is really affirmative action, uh, to ensure equal access to the enjoyment of rights. Uh, once, that, uh, once that access is assured, then you, have, you can get rid of, uh, you should get rid of uh, those special measures of affirmative action. And, and as I said, the United States has tried to argue that there's no longer a need. It commits the parties to take measures to eliminate racial discrimination. So that the uh, state party, the United States, has promised not to itself um, commit racial discrimination, but also to keep other people from doing it, not to discriminate, to sponsor or defend discrimination. Article four, uh, Article four really talks about criminalizing uh, racial discrimination and the advocacy for racial discrimination. And this, uh, the only art, the only convention I can think of where actually the violation of the right should is the state's promise to criminalize a violation of the right. I'm, I'm not sure that there's any other convention that does that, but uh, it's interesting, that, and that's why the United States again goes back to its. Uh, constitutional right of uh, free speech trumping um, uh, the convention, private acts trumping the convention, uh, and so it refuses to criminalize hate speech, it refuses to criminalize a whole lot of other things that perhaps should be criminalized. Uh, criminalize incitement to racial hatred and hate speech. I think those are subjects, subject, uh, uh, subjects worthy of criminalization, but apparently the United States does not think so. Uh, Article 5 is the one where it talks about discrimination with regard to particular rights. So it's important to note that Article 5 and the list of rights that it has is not exhaustive. But it does point out the major rights that, uh, that should be uh, protected from discrimination. Um, equality before the law certainly is one of them. Uh, protection and security of persons is another. Uh, that is to say, the police can't go beat you up because you're black or Chicano or whatever, you know. Um, guarantee enjoyment of political rights as well as guarantee the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights. E even though the United States has not uh, uh, ratified the uh, uh, International Covenant on, Civil, on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, there are a great many ways of reaching those rights and imposing those uh, obligations on the United States. One is through special procedures. Obviously, the right to water is an economic and, uh, and social right. And yet, the, even though the United States does not recognize those rights, uh, uh, you can impose those standards. Housing, the right to housing, the right to education, all those things are social security. Uh, you can reach them through this convention or through special procedures. So it's, it's really important to know that. Uh, the accountability process you'll be hearing more about when, in, in Romero's uh, presentation, the periodic review, list of issues, uh, letter from the uh, from the CERD, a periodic report by the by the country, a parallel or shadow reports by civil society, face-to-face -face examination by uh, the committee. And NGOs and individuals are not allowed to participate in those examinations, so we have to go there and stalk the poor members of the committees and grab them at lunch or in the bathroom and <laughs> shove the paper down their nose and <laughs> invite them to lunch. And then they issue their conclusions. Uh, again, uh, we've been very lucky in, in being able to establish personal relationships with uh, some committee members. And they are invaluable when, they, when the hordes descend on Geneva <laughs> as they did the, the last examination. Uh, it's just... Uh, a real competition between people uh, and trying to get their issues heard and addressed. And so it's, uh, it's difficult, it's difficult. There is an individual complaints procedure uh, under Article 14 where the state has to recognize the competence of the committee and the United States, as has been pointed out, does not recognize the competence of any human rights body anywhere in the world to hear complaints. So uh, we have to do it other ways. With regard to the, uh, the CERD, uh, we're very fortunate that it has an urgent action early warning, early, early warning process. Uh, uh, I, I, I was going to start with uh, periodic, uh, with uh, shadow report and periodic review, but I'll hopefully 
you're going to get a lot of that. But with regard to why we do it, if we don't tell them what the situation is, they won't know. And they won't be able to address it adequately. The United States, like any other government, is not going to say, we really are bad. They're going to say, oh, we're trying real hard, you know. So, you know, people are getting crushed, but, but, but we're, we're doing better, you know. Uh, it, it really confronts and challenges hypocrisy and impunity, and, and the United States is as guilty of that as any other country. International standards, the standards that are imposed super, can supersede the Constitution. Um, certainly, the, with regard to the, the Marshall Trilogy, which is the racist basis of the relationship between Indians and the United States, the CERD has been very critical in recognizing the hypocrisy and the racism inherent in that constitutional standard that continues to be imposed on uh, Indians in the United States today. And that includes the plenary powers doctrine that the state can do whatever it damn well feel like doing to Indians with impunity. Um, it is a pressure on the states to change and I like, I like the way uh, uh, Lisa articulated it. Uh, uh, I, uh, what did you say? Uh, Anyway, it was the international standards do in fact, uh, are in fact uh, much broader and much more uh, rational really with regard to race discrimination as other rights than United States policy. Um, it, does, it is pressure on the states to change their policy. But I think uh, probably the most important thing that, that we've had, that we've, um, that we've um, dealt with, with with international uh, standards is uh, is, uh, is that it does in fact uh, provide uh, credibility to our to our position uh, and we actually with Indians there's no place else to go uh, in examining the conclusions of the CERD in the past the, the US has been examined twice in 2001 and 2008 at least the conclusions came out in those years. Uh, they got it right the first time uh, when they made a, a statement noting that the persistence of the discriminatory effects of the legacy of slavery, segregation, and destructive policies with regard to Native Americans. They got it right. And that's, that's that, and I don't think uh, that's been ever really articulated that, that succinctly and that well and that fast by an international body. The thing is that th these people know, are experts in their field, and, they, and uh, they understand the nature of racial discrimination as they do uh, other rights and other conventions. And it's, 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 uh, it's very gratifying, really, that you don't have a Scalia kind of a <laughs> person there. Uh, they dealt with disproportionate incarceration, according to racial groups, the death penalty, uh, voting rights, uh, torture, and the plenary powers doctrine with regard to the United States and Indians. Uh, there's also a lack of implementation of the standards of the CERD, and they also uh, went after the U.S. for the reservations. I think uh, it, it really behooves you, if you really plan to use the CERD, to read these two prior reports, uh, to get a, a picture of the kinds of issues that they address. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised in some instances that they take a broad, an expansive view of discrimination. Um, the, one of the things that the United States has been arguing before the CERD is, we go back to the definition where it says uh, the purpose or effect is an uh, impairment of a human right. Uh, the United States uh, takes the position that they don't intend to discriminate, so that a, a, a discrimination in fact is not their fault. I mean, it's, uh, Black people and Indians are incarcerated at a higher percentage than any other racial group because they commit more crimes. And they're housed, they're, they live in poor housing and uh, have a shorter life expectancy because they're poor. Not because they're discriminated against, they just don't get a job, you know, they just don't have a job. They don't go to school because they don't qualify. They don't go, you know. So when you take a, when you take a view, uh, they, I mean, the data, the first time I did a, re, a shadow report for the CERD, I, I got as much data as I could on Indians' discrimination. Uh, you know. It was incredible, the picture that the data presents when you aggregate it, when you, when you get it all together, is a, an incredible, a system that it fails, that fails uh, 
there's something wrong with the system, man. Definitely wrong with the system. Disease, every conceivable social indicator is just bad for Indians and I think for mostly for, uh, for other uh, uh, people of color. So uh, uh, this is one place where you can get, uh, where, you, where you can paint that picture. They, they do have an accountability mechanism called the Urgent Action Early Warning. Uh, since the United States has not accepted the competence of the committee to receive complaints, uh, this is a good way to go. Uh, there are 16 decisions on the website, at least 12 on indigenous issues. We've been using this uh, urgent action uh, early warning process for a long time. We used it to challenge pending legislation, uh, the Foreshore Seabus Bill in, in New Zealand as an urgent action. Uh, the Sami peoples were going <laughs> this. Fin Finmark, their, 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 their core ancestral land was going to get turned over to the state and, and, and licensed for, uh, for development, for mining and shit. You know, so, uh, so, so that pending legislation was also uh, challenged uh, successfully uh, through this. We challenged uh, mining in Guatemala and the United States and Canada and Alaska through this process. Uh, so for indigenous peoples, this has really been a complaints procedure, particularly in the United States. Uh, I did a thing on uh, Rapa Nui in uh, Chile a couple of years ago, and I, I left the program uh, after that, and I was, as I was doing research to prepare for this, we actually got a, a, a good letter against Chile as a result of our complaint uh, with regard to Chile claiming, uh, claiming uh, Rapa Nui as uh, theirs and wanting to build a hotel. So much, I mean, it was, uh, it was just incredible. Anyway, uh, that situation is now in the... Uh, Inter-American system. The urgent action is, uh, requires immediate attention to prevent or limit the number of serious violations, the presence of serious massive or persistent patterns of racial discrimination, or situ uh, situations where there is risk of even more profound racial discrimination. Uh, the fact is that these standards, uh, uh, these what we would call admissibility standards, this is the kind of uh, this is the kind of factual situation you need, is uh, relatively loose. Uh, but you can challenge legislation, mining, development, uh, you know, all the way from uh, mining to, uh, to the building of hotel on indigenous lands. Uh, um, Supreme Court decisions, <laughs> we've challenged those. Uh, the Western Shoshone challenged an old uh, 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 decision based on the Indian uh, Land Claims Commission where the, uh, the CERT and the Inter-American Commission uh, really called to question the entire system of the United States adopted to, uh, to, uh, to uh, perfect title to, uh, to Indian land, to public, well, it's not public land. Um, one of the issues that I think is re uh, really has, uh, should be used, and we have used it with regard to indigenous peoples, but I think in, in the U.S. is environmental racism. I think it's a perfect, uh, it's a perfect issue. Most of the time, these uh, treaty monitoring bodies will address matters of national policy or that matters of national effect. Uh, and very rarely do they get into individual situations. Uh, we rely on special procedures for the, uh, the particular situation. But, with, but in this case, with regard to the urgent action process, that's one way of raising a particular issue in a particular place. Uh, and that then is follows them uh, throughout the process and into the periodic review into, uh, into uh, uh, UPR. I mean, it's one way to just keep hitting them with the issue. I mean, what I tell people is, yeah, we, we only get a recommendation. We don't get a, an enforceable judgment from these people. It's like sending them a bill. And every time they do something bad, we send them another bill. And one day, we're gonna be there to collect. And that's, that, that is my, uh, that is my, uh, my aspiration. So it's really good to, uh, to know these things, but there are ways that the urgent action process is one thing that uh, could be used more effectively. The reason that there are uh, so many complaints outstanding um, is that um, uh, there's no follow-up. One of the things that you have to do with all of these things is follow-up. You have to keep reminding them that there's something on their plate. Well, with regard to the action, urgent action process, uh, if I could go back to, well, with regard to the action action process, the committee meets twice a year. 
that meets in, uh, in Geneva or Alter meets. You sh if you're going to file, file an urgent action process, do it at least two weeks before the session so it can be calendared for that session. They don't have intersessional uh, meetings. So that's when they're going to consider it. So if you're going to file an urgent action process, do it two, at least two weeks before their, their next session. Um, um, they have general recommendations as, uh, as, as does every other uh, convention and some of them are interesting. These are the subjects, uh, subject matters of some of those general recommendations. With regard to racism, there's nothing there that I could find that was really kind of out of the ordinary except for the one on indigenous peoples and uh, I could do another hour on that one. It's really good for us. It's re it does us uh, justice. Uh, the key website, uh, you're probably going to get that soon. Uh, OCHR, Office of High Commissioner, uh, uh, Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, and then uh, all treaty, all uh, the all human rights bodies, and you'll find everything you ever wanted to know about uh, human rights and uh, UN mechanisms. So thank you very much. I think we'll be available for questions uh, sometime soon. How much time do you want to do for questions? I think so, I'll see what I can do. Good morning, everyone. Very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Lisa, and thank you for the, uh, the uh, great introduction. Let's see here. So my name is uh, Colin Bailey. I am the executive director of the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. That is a statewide coalition, as the name suggests, of over 70 primarily grassroots community-based organizations and communities around the state ranging all the way from the far north, north with primarily uh, California Indian tribes um, to the far south where we have primarily um, farm worker communities and descendant of farm worker communities in the agricultural areas as well as large urban constituencies of immigrant populations. The issues that we cover range uh, everywhere from um, the health of fisheries and subsistence fishing to um, indigenous people's rights, for example, with the Winnow and Wintu around the headwaters of the Shasta Dam, which is currently proposed for an 18-foot raise, which would submerge all of their uh, remaining ancestral lands underwater. Um, we have um, a large public health um, charge and uh, deal with the extraordinarily large problem with groundwater contamination um, with nitrates in the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, Salinas Valley, Coachella Valley, and it goes on and on. Um, but I'm here today to talk to you about one of our really exciting campaigns um, the Human Right to Water campaign in California. And before I do that, I um, wanted to uh, tell you about, there are actually two stories that uh, converge together, and it, it's a little bit self-indulgent because it's kind of a history of my last five years <laughs> as an attorney, which by the way, I should say for the record in case anyone's for the state bar, I'm on inactive status, which uh, oddly robs me of my ability to call myself an attorney. So I am a member of the bar, just uh, inactive at the moment. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I did as a legal aid attorney representing a homeless uh, group that had adopted a human rights framework for its advocacy um, and how we engaged with the special rapporteur on the right to uh, water and sanitation and then tell you about how that actually led to my new job in which I, you know, I've served for now six months and the role that we played there on uh, a legislative campaign, which is yet another um, avenue that you all can take up. So a brief history of the human right to water and sanitation. Um, these were not uh, rights, that is the right to water and sanitation, part of the kind of original panoply of um, human rights. And that probably has a lot to do with the fact that the people who were suffering the injustice of not having ready, readily available access to water and sanitation were not at the table when those uh, decisions were being made. Um, and there was a little bit of an assumption, I think, that like air, which we all know now not to be true, water was equally accessible to everybody. It's just kind of out there, everybody got access to it. So over the last um, probably 20 years or so, with a real emphasis on the last 10 years, there's been an international campaign to get the human right to water and sanitation kind of on the international human rights agenda with some very good success. Um, so I think one of the seminal um, bumps forward in the development of this right was actually the uh, hiring, the chartering of the independent expert, now special rapporteur, um, Katarina de Albuquerque, 
of, on the human right to water and sanitation. And that happened just as recently as 2008. So we're dealing with a very, very new right that is, um, because of its newness, very controversial. Um, and uh, she had actually done, her, her, her original charge was to go around and collect facts. As, as was said earlier, they are the eyes and ears of the UN. So she was supposed to go um, on country missions to do fact finding and did so in, you know, throughout parts of Africa, India, and had actually avoided many of the uh, major Western countries. And so there was a big campaign um, by perhaps people in this room, um, people I don't know, but people who were out there advocating with her directly to please come to the United States. There's more to see here than you might think on first blush. And so she did. And um, that was in uh, 2011. Through a whole series of networks, um, people working in legal aid and um, in human rights, so the crossover usually with housing and homelessness, contacted my office way out in Sacramento and said, there's this person, and I had to look up who this person was <laughs> from the UN, I had to learn exactly what Reza has just reminded me of, and said, this person's coming to Sacramento um, and they want to meet with homeless people who are having difficulty accessing water and sanitation. And we said, well, that's not a problem, that's pretty much every homeless person. Um, and it just so happened that um, in 2008, when the economy crashed in, in remarkable fashion, there sprang up in Sacramento a tent city. Some of you may have actually seen this on the Oprah show. It garnered incredible national and, in some instances, international attention. Um, and out of that sprang an organization called Safe Ground Sacramento. And that group was um, primarily made up of people living homeless, uh, along the, the American and Sacramento River Parkway. For anybody who doesn't know Sacramento's geography, um, it's a fairly densely um, populated urban area right along the confluence of the Sacramento and American River, two of the largest, Ameri uh, two of the largest rivers in the American West. And there's this absolute gem of, uh, of open space that runs for 80 some miles between Sacramento and the Folsom Dam um, that's so at some instances three miles wide. So it actually provides an extraordinary place for homeless people to find some respite from the daily harassment of law enforcement in the city. And so there are these, tent, there are these camps um, that sometimes number in the dozens and during the economic crisis numbered into the uh, near a thousand and in, introduced into that population people that were not typically associated with homelessness. That was a lot of, a lot of families, single mother families with their kids. Um, meanwhile, the budgets were crashing elsewhere and um, um, you know, the California Department of Corrections, their, their discharge policy for sex offenders was to dump them into these camps. So, camps. so you had homeless people with children living right next to um, sex, of sex offenders with ankle bracelets, and it was not a particularly good uh, scenario. So people came together around that. Among the things that um, came to light was that the city and county were in fact using the city ordinances against um, camping and against provision of things like water and uh, porta potties as a, a bludgeon to basically make it so uncomfortable for the people living out there who had no other option uh, that they would um, not choose to be homeless. Um, you can see all the assumptions that are built up in, in <laughs> that way of thinking, but I won't address those right now. Um, so it was in that context then that the special rapporteur came to Sacramento. And in preparation for this, we were a legal aid office, didn't particularly characterize ourselves as uh, human rights lawyers, um, had to brush up, so we, went to the Human Rights Network and the Bring uh, Human Rights Home Network and said, who knows how to do this? And um, it was an interesting thing to find out that there wasn't actually a lot of, there weren't templates out there. I said, so <laughs> when somebody does this, what does one do? And people said, well, you know, here's the law. And well, <laughs> that doesn't exactly get us to the where to go and what to do. Um, so we undertook it like, um, you know, the community, community lawyers that we had trained to be, which is we went directly to our clients said, bring forth um, you know, as many people as you think would be good spokespersons for this cause. And we sat down and conducted many, many hours of interviews that we taped and got re uh, releases for, because this is a population um, for anyone who's not worked with them that uh, is fairly recalcitrant in many respects and oftentimes does not want to be um, you know, kind of put on the spot in, in either a courtroom setting or a formal testimony setting. So we got all these wonderful videos. And then set to the task of transcribing these and submitted um, to the special rapporteur in advance of her visit uh, an extraordinarily detailed 
brief, essentially, on all of the things that were going poorly with respect to homeless uh, access to water and sanitation. Um, but then what happened in, in really extraordinary fashion is she came into a room that was probably a third the size of this one, and there were maybe 20 homeless persons uh, sitting around. And um, I have only met this particular special rapporteur, but she's extraordinary. I mean, <laughs> what an incredible individual. She's as zealous an advocate as anyone could, could want. So she came in there, and it was just a firebrand. She, she barely sat down for a moment. She went around, shook everyone's hand, you know, was incredibly engaging, and so people felt really at ease. And when they felt at ease, immediately their tongue started to flow. And you could just see her taking in and coming to the realization that I don't think had been there previously, that, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I have seen in the poorest parts of India, in the poorest parts of Africa, in the poorest parts of the world, right here in the richest state and the richest country in the world. And um, it, it was a powerful moment. Um, among the most powerful testimony that was provided that day was by a gentleman uh, named Tim Buckley, and he called himself the sanitation technician for Safe Ground. So in these large tent camps, there was no place to go because the city and county had in fact uh, closed many of the restrooms along the American River Parkway as, as a means to basically stop the bad behavior of being homeless. And um, he described how on a daily basis, in order to do service to his fellow um, community members uh, and, and out of a respect for you know, community stewardship and, and ecological stewardship, he created basically a pit privy into which people would do their business um, into a bag, um, which he would then carry in very large quantities, you know, wrapped up and went through his old procedure um, on his bicycle about five miles to the nearest open available um, public restroom to deposit the stuff, wash himself up, and do that over and over again three times a day. It was an extraordinary undertaking. Uh, and there was a moment where um, one of the safe ground leaders said, you know, well, we don't want to take up any more of your time. I'm sure you've seen far, far worse. And, and she told me on the car ride later that she, you know, didn't respond to that on purpose because, in fact, this is exactly what she had seen elsewhere. And so it became a powerful indication to her that something needed to be done here. Uh, I'm not in the habit of answering uh, my phone, which rings off the hook all day um, at Legal Aid, uh, if I don't know who's calling. And then I saw this one number that was like 28 digits long. I thought, hmm. I guess I better answer that. So I picked it up, and it was, uh, it was the special rapporteur. And she said, I wanted to tell you just how moving yesterday was. Um, I also want to tell you that um, there is this uh, procedure whereby you can submit complaints on behalf of your clients. I said, oh, really? OK, tell me more. Um, she said, well, I just want to let you know that if you were to do that, I could personally assure you that it would be taken to the highest diplomatic levels. So we thought, OK, well, there's our charge. Now, how does one do that? Well, <laughs> we didn't know. Again, that's where we turned to the, to the experts, and they said, well, there are various models out there, but no particular one template. So we did what we knew best, and that was to take, um, for anybody who practices law in California, um, a, a writ of mandamus, <laughs> basically a 1085 writ, and say the government is not doing what it should be doing, and use that format to take what we put in the report and outline all of the violations, incorporating um, as much of the international law um, and its history as we could uh, muster, um, and after close consultation, of course, with our client, put that forward, um, and then there was silence for, I can't remember how many months, four, five, six, seven months, something of that order, um, and then pretty much out of the blue, we find out that um, the following day, the special rapporteur, who's been doing some negotiating behind the scenes, is going to um, release a public statement we think, whoa, <laughs> what's this going to be? What are we going to do with this? Um, so we start rallying with our clients and say, let's see if we can make something of this. And um, for those who aren't aware, I actually didn't know what, the, what it meant that there was no special procedure for the US, but maybe this actually ties into that. You can explain it to me <laughs> in a moment. Um, she said the normal protocol is that the special rapporteur cannot uh, go, cannot speak directly to a local municipality. They have to go through the US um, what is it, the mission in Geneva. And then it goes through the State Department and trickles down. So we were, we were actually making plans with people we knew through relationships. This is all relationship-based, by the way. <laughs> Got to work those networks. Um, find out who was in the State Department to whom we could turn to try to make sure that there was some connection with the State Department once they received that complaint and the local level. 
And so a lot of strategizing had been done around that. And we've done some outreach. Um, and it wasn't looking particularly fruitful, um, which perhaps had trickled back to the special rapporteur. Because what she said is she got permission from the Obama administration to basically break with that protocol and sent to the mayor of Sacramento an open letter, which was copied to us, basically saying, here's the 20 pages where we outline all of the ways in which you have um, purposefully obstructed and many times negligently obstructed homeless pe person's access to um, water and sanitation. I thought, whoa, <laughs> what an extraordinary gift this is. And we weren't exactly you know, prepared to, to run with it, but there it was. And so we put together in the course of three hours a press statement that went out to um, you know, basically everywhere we could go. We reached out to our um, friends in DC and LA who had good press contacts. Uh, and that um, generated, as you might imagine, a, a tremendous amount of press. And the question was, what do we do with that press? So we held a press release on the steps of, or a press conference rather, on the steps of City Hall wherein those very same clients, uh, homeless clients who had been part of the uh, testimony to the special rapporteur were able to then to lay bare for the whole world to see, but especially for those responsible for it, all the ways in which their lives need to be improved to be, to be held accountable to international standards um, for human rights. And uh, the conversations, we, we had consistently been rebuffed in our, you know, in our reaching out to the city to try to figure out how to come up with a solution. You know, can you please just stop citing the mostly faith-based community groups that were coming out to provide water and porta potties to the homeless groups? And they didn't want to talk about it. It was a non-starter. Then the letter came, then the press came, and again, the blame and shame came into real, real hard effect with them. They, we cost them some serious points um, and got you know, press coverage all the way across, across the country saying, here's one place of all the places in um, the US that has been singled out for being a bad actor. And that was really powerful. So we got those invitations to come in and sat down and had real high level conversations, high level within the city that is, um, about what needed to be done to advance the work. Now, here's, here's one downside to this that doesn't, you know, you can't always, as, as an attorney representing a client, you can't always account for what the client wants to do. The, so the client being an organization had a board that was constituted of homeless persons and a lot of kind of intermediary folks that included, you know, homeless providers and et cetera, et cetera. And the people who were on the more provider side got a little nervous about the kind of antagonism the, uh, the, the conflict that this was generating and, and preferred a much more um, cordial kind of sit down, let's talk about this kind of approach. So they actually put the brakes, time already? Oh my goodness. They put the brakes on that. Um, but the good news is, just to wrap up that section, that, <laughs> the, that, the, um, that the city is in fact at this point taking a broader view and uh, is in negotiations with particular landowners to achieve the, the original intent of the Safe Ground Sacramento group, and that is to set aside a plot of land where homeless people can in fact live, and they've got these beautiful architectural huts that are gonna be totally off the grid and entirely um, self-managed by the homeless people living there, um, will ha and of course will be a place where homeless services can be provided. In uh, one minute or less, <laughs> Sorry, the, the second campaign, which unbeknownst to me was, was occurring simultaneously by the coalition that I now direct, um, was a legislative campaign in the state legislature to get a human right to water adopted by the state of California. The first round was undertaken during the Schwarzenegger administration and it was conducted in a kind of a legislative package. So there were five bills that went forward, all dealing with various aspects of access to water and sanitation. Um, a few of them got through um, to the governor, which were vetoed, um, but it was a very good uh, opportunity to educate a lot of uh, legislators about, and, you know, about the problems. There are upwards of two million people in California alone that's, that face um, unreliable access to safe and affordable water. This was a big opportunity, so they got that. The next legislative session, 2011-2012, was just this last year, um, we were able to get another package to go through, which included Assembly Bill 685, sponsored by um, then Assembly Member Mike Ng, which did incorporate a human right to water as the, the uh, governing policy of the state of California. And through some extraordinary uh, luck and, and great grassroots organizing, 
that bill was then placed on suspense and appropriations, which hid it from the opposition, industrial agriculture and the water districts who were afraid that they were gonna somehow have to give up all their water rights to the people who didn't already have it. Um, and we lobbied behind the scenes and that thing popped off of the suspense bill, which otherwise spells death for it um, at the last minute and our opponents couldn't rally around it. So it went to the governor's office where two of the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water's previous staffers were um, staffers and they went directly to the governor and said, hey, did you know there are two million people in California, et cetera, et cetera? And he said, I had no idea, that's embarrassing. I'm gonna sign this thing. So as of September 2012, it is now the state policy of California that the, every human being is entitled to safe, accessible, affordable, and reliable water um, for domestic purposes in California. The trick now is implementation. So we're meeting with agency heads, with the governor's office, with other legislatures, and trying to get that whole apparatus to further implement this really vague policy that's gonna take some figuring out what does an actual protocol look like for a bureaucrat who's sitting behind a desk saying, here's some funding eligibility criteria. We know the money's not getting to the poorest of the poor where it really needs to be spent. How do we go about making a human right real for those people? And what does that look like on a checklist? So I uh, elicit uh, suggestions from the group and hope that uh, any of you in the audience who are not yet affiliated or looking for internships, um, please do look my way because we could very much use the help exactly on that campaign. Thank you. Thank you so much, all three of you. Those were, I'm so sorry that our time is so limited because those are amazing stories, amazing experiences that you've shared. Um, let's take uh, 10 minutes for questions. It'll put us over, but um, I know that's why you're here. Uh, so we do have two microphones, um, one on either side. And if the green light is not on, um, just push that mute button and hold it down. And um, then we'll take your questions, or the panel will, actually. <laughs> so I'm curious, Colin, as you're talking about that, if there is a way to link the work that you did with the Special Rapporteur to the implementation to perhaps incorporate some of the recommendations she had made into implementation of the Human Rights Water. Yeah, th thank you for the <laughs> additional time. Um, so th in hustling through that second part of the story, I, I omitted the part where this all comes together in, in my small world, and that is that when the other groups were successful in getting the special rapporteur to come to California. It just so happened that that was at a critical moment when AB 6, or sorry, the previous human right to water bills were being heard in committee. So she was one of the formal affiants. She provided mm -hmm. testimony directly to the people who would be deciding whether this bill package in fact went forward, which is a really powerful um, dovetailing of those two things. Um, and you know, she's extraordinary and she will get out there and she's as activist a person as you could possibly imagine. I have not had experiences with other special rapporteurs, but the point is these are human beings. Their charter is to get out there and do stuff. Reach out to them. They've got an email that's public, uh, publicly available. Go, make, go build that relationship and invite them to be part of it. And then to uh, your question, um, we've uh, been very happily engaged with the uh, UC Berkeley International Human Rights Law Clinic. Uh, you're gonna hear from Roxana Altolz um, later this afternoon. And she and her um, colleagues over at that clinic have been working with us to provide kind of this human rights framework. So I brought with me only one copy, but I, I did include in your materials, I hope, okay, good, a, uh, a copy of a very recent um, document that outlines um, the case for the kind of the framework for human right to water implementation in California in the context of the international right. So they review in, in 10 pages, because that's all that any legislative staffer has time for, um, and they do it expertly well, all of the ways in which that right, um, you know, community participation, non-discrimination, all of the hallmarks of the international right um, are laid bare and said, this is the framework in which 
agencies need to be thinking when they're looking at um, adopting new regulations, revising old ones, uh, adopting funding eligibility criteria, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess I failed to mention that the human right to water in California is, is only addressed at this point as one of the compromises to state agencies, not to local agencies. We'll build on that with our grassroots campaign um, in future years. Hi, it's working. Hi, my name is Bianca Santos and I work with Georgetown Law Students on a migrants' rights project. And my question is for, I think, Risa or Alberto, I think either of you could answer, but can you talk a little bit more about the shadow report process and how a group of students, it could be, I mean, for the people in this room, an NGO or a group of students, how we could engage in actually any one of those, the SIR, the CAT, or the, um, the ICCPR in the shadow report process? Is it on? Oh, it's on. Uh, you'll hear more about the shadow report process, with particularly with regard to the ICCPR in Vanilla later on this afternoon. But uh, yes, I think there's a, a great opportunity for migrants, uh, particularly, to uh, to participate in that uh, in a wide variety of ways, uh, not just uh, the discrimination portion of the ICCPR. Um, yeah, there's, I, actually I wanted to make a, uh, so I, hopefully uh, the Jamil's uh, session will be helpful in that regard. Um, we certainly has been used in the, uh, uh, in the CERD process. Uh, we, uh, I think the last CERD examination uh, dealt with the Arizona legislation and the conduct of Sheriff Arpaio. So uh, there is a, there are, there's a great, great variety of ways, including special procedures as well. Uh, particularly, uh, there is a, a rapporteur on migrants, and there is also, uh, there's a other, uh, I mean, there's always the police malpractice kinds of uh, issues that can be raised as well. So, um, I agree, and Jamil will talk a lot about the ICCPR, but just practically speaking, I think a, a, a clinic can really engage um, with community organizations and can do that through the U.S. Human Rights Network and can also do it through um, the Bring Human Rights Home Lawyers Network to plug in to what organizations are working on, the issues they're concerned with, and then, frankly, offer <laughs> the, their services and the labor of students, because I think there are lots of opportunities, particularly the ICCPR, we're sort of really right in the midst, and there's still an opportunity to do shadow reporting, um, but folks are just starting to gear up for the CERD, and there are task, there's a task force on the CERD, so um, the, you, know, you can join that task force or get on the listserv through the U.S. Human Rights Network. Well, actually, uh, just quickly, uh, you don't have to be in the uh, consultative status to, to file a report, and it can be in any form. I, some of the best, we had a great result uh, with the CERD with a simple letter, a page and a half letter that uh, imposed on the United States an obligation to uh, make its uh, in, uh, corporations accountable for the violation of human rights outside of the United States. Uh, and Canada, we did that against Canada as well, and it was just in the form of a letter. So it, it can be as much or as little as you like. I think with regard to the right to water, I, I, I was working on it myself. Uh, uh, internationally, the issue is privatization. Uh, Bechtel Corporation going and, uh, and buying uh, or trying to sell water to people who can't afford to pay for it, creating situations of cholera in South Africa. Uh, that internationally, that is that has been the struggle with regard to the right to water. This is a question for for Alberto also. Um, a follow up to the CERD, um, the recommendations. I'm just curious. Do you know of any um, NGOs or or advocates on behalf of prisoner rights that may have used the CERD to make the argument on behalf of African Americans, for example, that they're so overrepresented in the prison system? that you know just putting together the numbers like you were saying the picture is so clear about the issue of discrimination i'm just curious you know if that's ever been if that argument has ever been made oh yeah i i think the, the in fact the the last uh, the last uh, conclusions by the CERD went into uh, went into disproportionate incarceration um, of uh, of people of color uh, i don't know if one of the problems that we have with human rights in the United States is that we get these great results from international mechanisms, and the press just doesn't touch them. It, it just, there's almost like uh, a purposeful avoidance 
of uh, uh, international human rights as applied to the United States. It's, it's, uh, I honestly don't know why. I think it is newsworthy. Uh, I think that any time, uh, I'm, I mean, a great variety of issues, and that is one of them. Uh, it does have an effect, though, and hopefully, I guess uh, tomorrow morning there'll be talk about one of the things that has been useful, I think, the, the international standards has been in uh, life without parole for juveniles uh, or a death penalty for juveniles. Uh, so I think there has been, I think the Supreme Court has, or at least Justice Kennedy has responded to an international standard. Uh, but with regard to publici publicity, with regard to uh, uh, remedies uh, imposed uh, locally, uh, we're still, we still, we really need to struggle with that. I think incorporating what we, the results we get internationally into the struggle, that is incorporating those results as part of our struggle, I think has been very useful for Indians. It's been very useful for us to talk about international standards with regard to San Francisco Peaks or a wide variety of issues, the Shoshone case. Uh, it's been very useful for us to incorporate those results and say, see, the international community agrees with us the United States is violating our rights. But that the, that the press would pick that up and publish it, I mean, Indian country today will do it, but nobody else seems to be interested. So just in closing, I just want to underscore how wonderfully creative <laughs> Alberto and Colin are in engaging with these mechanisms as they've implied there's no particular format for lodging these complaints um, and there's certainly no blueprint for implementing uh, the recommendations that come out. It's really up to the creativity of the lawyers and the communities to figure it out. And this is a relatively um, new uh, way of lawyering in the United States, right? Within the last 10 years, folks are doing this more and more. So folks are available to talk about it. Everybody really loves to share information. We can all build best practices together. Um, so you're not alone if you want to engage in this or lots of folks to talk with, but just don't, don't be intimidated because there is no perfect way of doing it. We're all sort of learning together. Um, so I encourage folks to do that and to share stories and examples and best practices so that we can build it in a more productive way.